The Holy Gospel according to Matthew, the 21st chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. When Jesus entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him as he was teaching and said, By what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? Jesus said to them, I will ask you one question. If you tell me the answer, then I will also tell you the by what authority I do these things. Did the baptism of John come from heaven or was it from human origin? And they argued with one another. If we say from heaven, he will say to us, why then did you not believe him? But if we say of human origin, we are afraid of the crowd for all regard John as prophet. So they answered Jesus, we do not know. And he said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. What do you think? A man had two sons. He went to the first and said, son, go and work in the vineyard today. He answered, I will not. But later he changed his mind and went. The father went to the second and said the same. And he answered, I go, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? They said, the first. Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are going into the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. And even after you saw it, you did not change your minds and believe him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Thank you for inviting me into the life of your congregation today. It is truly an honor and privilege to come to you with a message of love as we share not only the gospel, but a reading from Exodus 17 as well. Now here at Resurrection in Fredericksburg, where I serve, we are finishing up a worship series entitled Through the Wilderness. And we've studied the various readings from Exodus that detail Israel's departure from Egypt and the 40-year wanderings and adventures in the wilderness. Now, one of the things that I'm called to do as a pastor in the ELCA is to connect scripture to the life that we are living right here and right now. So in other words, where do we see ourselves in God's salvation history? And what difference does the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ make in our lives? And what can we learn from the scriptures that we can apply to our lives? Now, I think that all of you would, would agree that we are traversing a wilderness as we experience the pandemics of COVID-19 and systemic racism and poverty. Wildfires assault our West Coast and storms are lined up to impact our East Coast. Add to all of that rampant unemployment, civil unrest, and economic challenges with a presidential election and, well, I don't know about you, but I'm really feeling the wilderness. And like those Israelites, I'm weary, I'm tired, I'm anxious, I'm scared, and I hunger and I thirst. Now I'm not looking for food or water per se, rather, as we recite in our baptismal covenant, I hunger for justice and peace in all the world and in our land and in our communities. That justice and peace in all the world that we are to be striving for. Now in Exodus 17, the Israelites were once again unhappy campers and they were getting on Moses' last nerve. What shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me, he cries out to God. So sending Moses with his staff in hand to Horeb, the Lord said to him, I will be standing in front of you. Strike the rock and water will come out so that the people may drink. 
God showed up. But I confess, just like those Israelites so long ago who quarreled and tested God, I'm asking too, is the Lord among us or not? Is this not the question we ask, especially during difficult times and extreme anxiety? And as I was taught in seminary, Wigiot, where is God in all of this? Now at that moment in Exodus 17 and many other moments besides, the Israelites totally miss what God has done, is doing, and will do for them. They are too busy whining and threatening and complaining to notice. All they want is their needs satisfied. They want water and they want it now. And they completely dismissed all the other times that God provided water without fail and bread for the journey as well. God uses the journey in the desert of God's people for transformation. God uses the wilderness experience to transform them from an enslaved people to that of an independent nation. And they had many habits to unlearn. And they also had many things to learn as well, such as trusting God when the world had told them, just like it tells us today, that you will only survive if you distrust and are skeptical. Here was God's kindness and mercy bestowed upon them, and yet every time the going got rough, all they wanted to do was return to that former enslaved life. And so the Israelites totally missed the joy of the moment of receiving that life-giving gift of water. And they're remembered for their complaining and not for their celebrating of what God has done, is doing, and will do for them. Now, we all talk about when things get back to normal, when phase four is finally here and we can gather again like normal. But the reality of our situation is that there is no going back, and the Israelites couldn't go back, and neither can we. But what we're going to find is that God has used our wilderness journey to transform us to transform our hearts and minds to more fully experience the joy of God's gift of love and mercy. But how will we remember it? How will we be remembered? What story will we tell? And that's where we meet Jesus in the gospel today, in the temple telling yet another one of his parables, a story that is not necessarily true, but reveals truth about God, Jesus, the kingdom of God, and of course, all of us. Now, Jesus is in a politically charged climate with the potential to ignite at any moment. Just days before, we heard refrains of Hosanna, save us. It was Palm Sunday. And Good Friday and Golgotha are just around the corner. Jesus has cleansed the temple by tossing out the money changers. He's cured the blind and the lame in the most sacred and holy places, the temple. Here the unclean were being made clean again. So the status quo had been disrupted and the chief priests and elders of the people are uneasy and anxious. Now, this group of leaders has been charged with keeping peace among their people. And if this rabbi is coming into town and stirring up the people, then they have a responsibility. A responsibility, whether it was either foisted by or taken willingly from the Roman authorities. You see, these are the chief priests. They're tied to the temple around which the Jewish world revolves. Here they provide focus and stability in a chaotic world. And this has kept the Jewish people safe. And the chief priests have become the agents of Rome. And elders of the people. These are not just the old people of the group that are leaders. They are tied to the people. 
the same people who have trusted the promise that made them Jews and the faithfulness. They have a vested interest in keeping the city calm at all costs as well. And so they come to Jesus and ask the question. And they ask the question not as adversaries, not yet. They ask, who are you? And by whose authority are you doing this? Now, really deep down, they too are asking, should we risk it all to follow you? Are you worth it? Or is this going to, is this going to be worth another major battle or perhaps even a war? Can we trust you? Jesus understands their predicament. He asked them about John the Baptism and John the Baptist and about himself. And they don't know how to answer and simply say, I don't know. Now, Jesus is not about to tell them what to think. They and we too have to figure it out. So Jesus speaks some parables to help them. Now, number one son, here's an interesting relationship. He's very bold to say no to his father's request. Trust and no fear, very honest and open communication between parent and child. And the father's response? He doesn't return with a threat. There's no punishment. The implied message is, I love you. I will always love you. Now there's work to be done and I won't be troubled by your refusal. I'm moving on. And so dad just takes the request and moves on to son number two. Now as dad is moving on to son number two, something miraculous happens. The first son has had a change of heart. Maybe perhaps some pangs of regret. And so he goes out and does what has been asked of him. You see, something bigger than the father or son is at work here. And about son number two, what about that relationship? I go, sir. That's a strange way to talk to your dad. I don't think I would have ever gone up to my dad and say, I love you, sir. There's no ring of closeness. You get the feeling that the number two son has been holding dad at arm's length. Now, he was also following the rules of first century family. You don't say no to the authority figure. Sure, I'll do it. And then does it. He didn't go to the vineyard. He didn't fulfill his commitment. His heart was heart. But his father loves him anyway. You see, it's not what you've done or not done that matters to Jesus. It's the transformation of the heart. And that is why Jesus says, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are going in ahead of you because they believed and it transformed their hearts and minds. Now the chief priests and elders become angry. They've missed what Jesus says. They will go ahead of you, not instead of you. You see, they're still going to go in, just not in the order that they imagined. There was no focus on transformation of heart or mind or soul. There is hope in the kingdom of God. It is never too late to respond to the grace of the gospel. Saying no in the past doesn't mean that yes can never be in the future. God is here, inviting each and every one of us. God is reaching out to everyone, no matter what and offering the gift of love, grace, mercy, and forgiveness. This is what Jesus proclaims. This is what the kingdom of God is all about. And when Jesus says all, he means all. Jesus doesn't give up on anybody. I thank God that Jesus doesn't give up on me. I have a lot of transforming to do. And I'm just as guilty as the next person. I draw lines in the sand. I categorize and condemn others. And I don't even know it sometimes. I sort them out 
based on what they say or don't say, where they stand on a particular issue, the color of their skin, where and how they worship, and the list goes on. We all do it. Funny thing about that line in the sand, though, after we finish all of our sorting, we will always find Jesus standing on the other side. Like I said, when Jesus says all, he means all. Now what is true is that each and every one of us is a child of God and that God calls us to be neighbor to each other, to listen, to serve, to love, to reach out, to care. God told Moses, I will be standing there in front of you on the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock. You see, we're called to strike the rock. Lean on God and trust in Jesus. Strike the rock to find joy in these most difficult times. Strike the rock in faith, even if it means giving, even if giving up makes more sense. Strike the rock in trust. And when it comes right down to it, God's in charge and we're not. And we can trust that. So go ahead, strike the rock and drink the life-giving water of grace, mercy, and love. Amen.